I generally stay pretty aware of glycemic variability and try to reduce the number of blood glucose fluctuations that occur during the day. Not only because I feel like I have more stable energy levels when I do that, but because there are some people that swear that um, insulin surges and glycemic variability and blood glucose fluctuations actually are at the root of a lot of chronic diseases mm -hmm. and are at the root of uh, enhancing or decreasing longevity. Uh, you know, folks like uh, Peter Atia or Sammy Inkinen come to mind as, you know, uh, pe people who have who've talked a little bit about glycemic variability, Sammy being more on the athletic end and Peter being more on the, on the health end. But I, but I like that concept of being very hyper aware of how many times your blood glucose is fluctuating during the day. For me on a good day, like I've got zero blood glucose fluctuations until dinner. And what, what I mean by that is I'll have like the breakfast that I just described to you, yeah. which is you know, some protein in there, but not very gluconeogenic. And frankly, I wake up and I do some training anyways. So mm. I'm somewhat insulin sensitive in the morning just based on chronobiology. Yeah. You have increased insulin sensitivity in the morning, but then if I'm moving in the morning as well and jumping in that dang cold pool outside, like I'm not too concerned about like an insulinogenic response to protein mm -hmm. in the morning causing issues with me not being able to be a fat burning machine or, or throwing my glycemic variability all over the all over the place. Hey friend, welcome back. It's Mike Mutzel with highintensityhealth.com and as always I'm super excited and grateful that you're here. This episode is brought to you by ButcherBox.com, the suppliers of Pasture-Ray's 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef. As we've talked about before, guys, sometimes when you go to the grocery store and pay a premium for grass-fed beef, sometimes these, these cattle are in the feedlot eating grass pellets. They don't actually touch the green pastures. So that's why I love ButcherBox and their mission. And as a high-intensity health listener, you can save over $10 per month and get a free package of 100% grass-fed, grass-finished ground beef with the lifetime of your account. So you can do that by going to butcherbox.com forward slash H-I-H dash two. Now I do wanna mention they also supply free-range organic chicken as well as pasture-raised, hormone-free, sugar-free, heritage-bred pork products. Guys, at our house, we love their bacon. It tastes absolutely amazing. My daughter loves it. So these promotions, guys, I would encourage you to act now because if you've been watching these videos for a while and you saw the free bacon promotion that we had going on in June, that had already expired. This promotion is great as well, but they don't last forever. So again, that URL is butcherbox.com. Forward slash H-I-H-2. I'll put a link right here in the YouTube card in the link below. So this show with Ben Greenfield, it's an awesome discussion. I do want to let you know that we did film it back in February and I'm posting this in September. You might be like, what the heck? Why are you taking so long to do this? And I, I really, I'm not trying to withhold anything from you, but uh, I think it was like late March. I was about to post the show and on Ben Greenfield's Instagram, he was going in to film with Joe Rogan. So I was like, all right, I'm, I got to wait, you know, because there's going to be so much momentum and traffic. And I want to post this awesome chat right around that. And then he was on the Joe Rogan experience again. So Ben is a sought after speaker. And I just want to say in this discussion, we talk a lot about ketogenic diet applications, carb cycling, sleep, uh, hunting, uh, food quality, meat quality, a lot of great stuff that wasn't discussed in those different episodes. So there's going to be a lot of new things for you here. And I do want to say, uh, having gotten a tour of Ben's house, he lives a very congruent and authentic, uh, how should we say, healthy lifestyle, right? I mean, there's no Wi-Fi in the home. It's all Ethernet hardwired. His kids are outside. It was like in February. They were, it was really cold and snowy, playing in the snow. He's got goats and chickens. So out of all the, the houses that I've been to, I'd say Ben Lynch and Ben Greenfield are like really living this lifestyle that I'm trying to help you guys better understand because your, your diet is super important, but how you live, how you sleep, your stress reduction your strategies, the amount of non-native EMF that you're exposed to plays a key role into your health uh, and disease progression, and putting on muscle, burning fat, and all that. So I'm going to stop rambling. Let's dive back into it with Ben Greenfield. If you want to check out the audio version, it's over in, in iTunes, and the show notes are below. As we were talking, you know, this, there's this whole movement towards these carnivorous diets, and people are saying plants yeah. are bad. And, you know, I yeah. mean, I think there's some... So blood. bad. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. <laughs> What's unique about you, Ben, is you actually hunt you know, with your mm -hmm. hands, right? And all these people are like kind yeah. of waving their pom-poms. I don't hunt with my hands. I've never yeah. throttled a large animal. Right. But yeah, I hunt, hunt with, a, with a bow, an implement. Yeah. yeah. Um, how much of the meat that your family eats do you actually hand harvest yourself, like with the bow and that? 
Uh, you know, the average whitetail will last like three or four months of meat. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'll go down to, to Hawaii, which is an awesome place to hunt. It's so deer? much fun. You hunt at the base of the volcano. You can hunt wow. deer. Yeah. You can hunt deer in Hawaii. They have access deer in Hawaii, and that's like some of the best tasting wild game meat huh. on the face of the planet. It's like, it's better than elk. It's better than antelope. Uh, you can also hunt those in Texas. I hunted one in Texas yeah. and made amazing summer sausage with the boys with access meat. And I mean, the back strap just like melts in your mouth. Wow. It's, it's amazing. But I'll be going down to Kona to hunt sheep, goat, turkey, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna hunt scrub cattle while I'm hmm. down there, which is basically like a cattle that feeds on wild plants. Wow. And it's amazing meat and super tasty. And I've never shot one before, but I mean, coming back from Hawaii, that'll feed the family for a year. Right? Yeah. I'll put all that in coolers and ship it back. And it, it might sound a little bit silly to go to like fly in an airplane to go all the way to an island to mm. hunt. But part of it is the experience, right? Yeah. Like it's an adventure. Like I'll bear crawl and jog and sprint like 50 miles over the course of five or six days going after these animals. Right. And it's a hoot. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. Plus it's not legal hunting season up here in mm-hmm. Washington state right now. Yeah. And um, so if I want to hunt, I got to got to go somewhere mm-hmm. or else break the rules. <laughs> right. So you have to like hand harvest it right there, pack it out, and then they freeze it for you and ship it on the plane? Or uh, Well, what I'll do is fill dress mm-hmm. what I kill and then uh, just get like those styrofoam coolers. Yeah. And once you freeze the meat, it kind of acts as its own ice cubes, right? Because right. it's all frozen. And then you know, freeze it, duct tape or, or tape the, the cooler shut mm-hmm. and then ship that back. Uh, if I get it done in time, I'll just literally check it as checked baggage on the plane. Yeah. If I don't, I'll ship it. That's awesome. Yeah. And so you can taste the difference in the, in the meat, you know, from oh, Hawaii? Dude, yeah, the, like the pigs down there, they yeah. eat like macadamia nuts and wow. avocados keto and, you know, pigs. and little, little mangoes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they're like keto pigs. Um, any animal that that is low stress or that feeds on, you know, wide ver- diversity mm-hmm. of wild plants versus garbage and human food or yeah. corn or, or soy or whatever, I think tastes better. Mm-hmm. And uh, in addition to that, like actually we were talking about the best tasting wild game meat. You know what is, is widely considered among hunters to be at the top, like the best? Bear? I don't know. No, zebra. Huh. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Zebra. I've actually seen a zebra before while I was hunting in Texas. They've introduced them as like a like an indigenous species or whatever, because oh. some people will pay. Yeah. Like, I think they're expensive, right. like tens of thousands of dollars to yeah. go like get a zebra tag and go kill a zebra. That's amazing. But uh, there's even a book out there called Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Mm-hmm. Right. And an animal that's low in cortisol and low in stress hormones and kind of lives a little bit of an easier life and isn't, you know, isn't in a super stressed out, you know, CAFO type of format. Mm-hmm. I think the meat tastes better and I suspect it's also higher. The same reason that wild plants yeah. Are, are a little bit better for you and and granted overdoing that can can overdo the hormetic effect and and put you into a an in, in, you know inflamed gut tizzy mm-hmm. but ultimately like like a, a wild plant or wild game meat i think uh, imparts some benefits yeah it turns you into a into a, a wild man or wild woman yourself totally yeah. that's amazing i didn't know that the zebra so you can bring that down with a bow a zebra I, I don't know. Yeah. I, uh, I got to feed my family and we'd be eating rice and beans for a long time if I yeah. shot a zebra once the zebra ran out because of all the money I'd have to spend on the <laughs> yeah. zebra. Uh, but you can, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's smaller than an elk, Yeah, you know, I shoot an elk with my bow. So right. I don't think a zebra would, would uh, be impervious to a, to yeah. a bow. <laughs> right, right through yeah. the, yeah, the rib cage. Yeah. Uh, what goes right through your mind? So you have the elk or the whitetail or whatever big animal and you're about to let go. Like, is there any hesitation that you're gonna kill that animal? Or like, what is going through your mind in that split second before you release? Kill an animal? Yeah. <laughs> it's, There's it's not a, much to it. No, like once, once the deed is done, then you know, you'll stand over the animal in the field and I'll say a prayer and mm. you honor the animal and you thank the animal and you thank earth for its provision. But when you're shooting, it's just, that's that's full on like, what do you call it? Like, uh, fight or flight, uh, yeah. your heart's well, pumping. Yeah, fight or flight, but, and your heart's pumping and you have to learn how to shoot under pressure. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's also like, just like completely ancestral monkey mind. You know, it's like, this is, like you don't think that much about what you're doing or, or look at its cute fuzzy whiskers or something yeah. like that. Like you just, you just shoot. Right. Yeah. Do you think yeah. there's some You go value. into the zone, right? It's like, a, it's like a, a professional basketball player shooting a free throw, right? Yeah. You're just like, you have to be in the zone. You can't be thinking about the person like 
you know, up in up in row ten B, waving mm -hmm. your little styrofoam pointy finger, right? When you're shooting a free throw, you, yeah. just, you, you just shoot the free throw. Do you think you're in a flow state? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you, that's exactly what I'm referring to yeah. right now. Yeah, absolutely. Full on alpha brainwave flow mm -hmm. state. Yeah. Yep. Um, how do you think that that hunting and the process of going through that and hen harvesting, you know, pulling off the back strap and field dressing it, how has that changed like your gratitude towards meat when you do consume it? You know what? I'm I'm not gonna lie and say that like the the French cut ribeye steaks we're gonna have tonight from you know grassland beef and I think they're in Nebraska like taste inferior to some animal that I've that I've harvested myself because they don't they taste really really damn good. Yeah. Uh, so ultimately, it's it's more like being able to eat an animal and know oh hey this is the cool story like when we have the leg of mutton from the sheep that I got the last time I was in Hawaii like I know right where I was standing mm -hmm. and. And right where I took it down, where it was, and what color it was, and how hard I worked for it, and maybe it does taste a little bit better because you know how hard you worked for it. Yeah. But um, it's not. It maybe I'm just not spiritually deep enough. But it's not like once I'm eaten, I'm eaten. I'm yeah. just like hungry and I want to eat. Totally. So, yeah. Have your kids been on a hunting trip yet with you? No. Yeah. No. Uh, they're taking a hunter's education class right now, and for kids hunting with a bow, they got to be able to pull at least forty pounds mm. you know, with the bow, and they're working their way up and. Yeah. Frankly, to take a kid hunting, unless you're going to do like tree stand hunting or blind mm -hmm. hunting, which I, I don't like to do as mm -hmm. much. I like to do like spot and stock hunting. Uh, they would scare the animals away just because they're you know, the more noisy. People you, the more people, I mean anything, like the more people you have out hunting, the more, yeah. the more you get. Even if you're hunting elk with a guide and just me, the guide's still 40 or 50 back, you know, calling, and I'm the only person up front, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, it's hunting parties don't work that well. Yeah, I can <laughs> yeah. see that. So yeah. more than two people, it's kind of too noisy. I mean, one too noisy, mul calling. multiple scents, you know, yeah. multiple steps, multiple vibrations, multiple twigs snapping. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, if it was safe, I'd love to just hunt all the time, just all on my very, very own. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So you're going out hunting. What are you eating when you're out there? I mean, you're out there, like you said, you're packing in sometimes 50 miles in a trip. Mm -hmm. um, what do you bring with you for food? Snickers bars, Gatorade G2 gel packs. Goos. Goose, lots of goose, yeah. and, and lots and lots of power bars, peanut butter power bars. Nice. Um, I uh, take as much real food as mm -hmm. I can. Um, honestly, these days, to, to go for a long time, I like macadamia nuts and those little spirulina chlorella energy tablets like LG. I realize that's not like something you would imagine like you know, a hunter, ancient mandarin, but it freaking works like macadamia nuts yeah. with, with chlorella and spirulina mm -hmm. that, that keeps you going for a long time and it burns really clean. So I like that. I like to harvest, like I, yeah. I like to forage. Uh, wild nettle, um, mint, dandelion, plantain leaf. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can just eat. Yeah. And again, a lot of these plants, you overdo it and you're gonna, you are gonna get exposed to a lot of lectins and, mm -hmm. and you know, uh, phytic acids and all sorts of stuff that that could do a number on your gut, but I like to forage a little bit just, For me, it's it's not because I don't have a ziploc bag full of macadamia nuts in my backpack It's mostly just to kind of say oh hey, I, I can do this right? Yeah. Like, uh, I I, I want to be that person that if I don't get anything to eat I can still live off the land and that's mm -hmm. what we try and do around here, too We try and incorporate a lot of elements of the land around us in our in our cooking or in our teas or in mm -hmm. our medicine cabinet whether it's organ grape root uh, that you can cut open with a knife and get access to, you know, that nice deep orange. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, a berberine-like blood sugar controller and, and anti-inflammatory for the gut to uh, wild nettle, which is some of the most nutrient-dense stuff, you know, known to man in yeah. plant format that grows like weeds around here, mm -hmm. you know. And um, there's a lot that you can eat that's just out there on the land. I, I have a little app called Flower Checker, and Flower Checker lets you take a picture of a plant, and then when you take a picture of the plant, it... Um, it, it sends it off to a team of live botanists on the other end who identify it within 24 hours and then sends you back like the medicinal, the edible properties. You can keep track of everything you've identified in like an online herbarium, wow. right? Where you can, you can say, yeah, I found this, I found that. And if you don't remember what it was, you can just log into your online herbarium and, and remember. So we have like this growing database of things that we found on our land. so cool. And wow. there are there are apps like um, Plant Snap is another pretty good one mm -hmm. that relies more on like Google reverse image esque kind of like artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to identify the shape and the color and where it was found to to spit out an approximate reply to you. But like I get like maybe thirty percent accuracy on something mm -hmm. like that where it'll it'll identify 
whatever, let, let's say like, um, you know, some rant, let's say comfrey or something like that. And I'll feed it in there. So it's like maple leaf. Or, mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't put that much trust in that. I would imagine within a few years, that technology will be, will be good enough to where you don't have to wait for a live botanist to identify the plant. But mm -hmm. at this point, I don't want to be that person who dies because yeah, I relied on artificial intelligence to identify yeah. <laughs> a mushroom. Um, so yeah, eat that, you know, just carry a water filter, like a life straw to filter out some water. And, um, I like jerky, right? Mm -hmm. Just like a good jerky, like, uh, you know, like the U S wellness meat stuff or the on it stuff or any of those companies, you know, Epic does a good jerky. So, yeah. you know, like good, good, clean jerky, um, plants, uh, macadamia nuts, LG, uh, I have on one trip gone out with just ketones, like mm. just ketones, just like ancient man would have yeah. exogenous ketones and they're little, I'm joking, ancient man. You're looking, yeah. you're looking yeah. at me like, yeah. oh yeah, ancient, ancient man didn't have ex exogenous ketones or ketone esters to hunt with, but right. honestly, like that stuff's like rocket fuel and keep you going for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, ketones work too, honestly, yeah. like, you know, granted you could just, um, calorically restrict and not eat and have water and go out for a hunt and that's that's fine that works too i mm. mean honestly you hunt better your senses get heightened yeah um your awareness goes up when you're hungry but at the same time if there's if there's like an animal like a few ridges away and you know you got to hike six miles to get to it like you want to eat something mm -hmm. right and i Feel don't that. think ancient man went out for hunts with nothing at all just so they could hunt better right, right. so i will have ketones or macadamia nuts or whatever and just like start hiking mm -hmm. so um so yeah those are some of the things that that i would eat though but like it sounds mostly like a low picky. carb you know good fat protein and then whatever plants and things you can find yeah mostly fats yeah. and plants yeah, yeah a little bit of protein but honestly if i you know if you get an animal you you know <laughs> crap ton of protein for dinner mm -hmm. that night. And you know, a lot of times when you get back to camp after, after a night of hunting, a lot of times like, you know, they'll be frozen this or frozen that from another hunt and yeah. you know, you keep some up on the stove and yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I asked a few hunter friends of mine, like what they would eat raw. So say you're famished, right? You've been you know, hunting all day, had no food. What would you eat raw from the animal first? From the animal? From the animal. I mean, if you were just absolutely starving, would you go for the heart, the liver, would you or I'd probably, you? I'd probably go for the back strap. Mm -hmm. um, Tenderloin, both of those are pretty soft. Most of the stuff that's gamey, like the offal, I wouldn't, because it tastes, you know, like a good heart or good mm -hmm. liver tastes really good soaked in raw milk or soaked in lemon for a day or so, but yeah. they're pretty, they're pretty gamey when you yeah. eat them raw. You know, a lot of folks are gonna like to eat the heart raw type of thing, but mm -hmm. I'd, I'd rather soak a heart in raw milk and slice it up and dredge it in coconut flour and egg and fry it up with some butter and some bacon and onions yeah. <laughs> versus eating it raw. But backstrap is pretty, um, it's pretty tender. Huh. That'd, that'd be one, or the tenderloin, or uh, um, yeah, those yeah. would be those would be a couple. I guess I could I could go all macho and say the balls, mm. yeah, but I've never actually done the Rocky Mountain oyster thing mm -hmm. myself. I haven't done it yet. Yeah, no, no, no but we could start a trend. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's something to that, like a hormetic effect or ectosterone, well, well, na nature signature. Yeah. Like oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we know walnuts are good for your brain and. Mm -hmm. Celery is good for erections and beets are good for your blood. So why wouldn't testicles yeah. be good for your testicles? I mean, right. like, uh, you know, uh, you know, Chinese medicine, same thing. There's, there's some, you know, teaching about like liver being good for your liver or, or heart being good for your mitochondria or, you know, a lot of the Tour de France riders will eat horse, which is very high in mitochondria and mm. iron. And, and that's like a performance enhancing meat. Right. So, wow. so yeah, absolutely. You could even like take it to the extent, you know, maybe, maybe by eating the, uh, the meat of a jackrabbit, right? You might enhance your fast twitch muscle fiber capacity mm -hmm. or something associated with, with the jackrabbit or I suppose like a kangaroo or something. Like right. I don't, well, I haven't seen many clinical studies about that kind of stuff. I would not, I would not deny that. Yeah. And you know, when I'm spearfishing, I eat fish. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe it helps it. me hold my breath. It's better. <laughs> I don't know. It yeah. tastes, tastes good when you're spearfishing to eat fish. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah I you mean, take it up off the boat and you ceviche it with a little lime and a little yeah. salt. You can catch like a, I mean, you can catch a freaking you know, parrot fish and, and cut it open and fillet mm -hmm. it and you know, put it in a little glass cup with some lime and some salt, go down for a dive, come back up and mm -hmm. you know, half hour later you got some ceviche to, to munch on. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, so we were talking before we started rolling about the carnivorous diet and how everyone just like, it seems like 
these trends are, I don't know if it's just the, the internet or more people are online or sharing or they're identifying with diets, right? But, you know, it seemed mm -hmm. like the paleo thing kind of took off and then the keto thing is, is like orders of magnitude more popular. Now, this whole zero carb carnivorous diet is, is kind of taking right. off. Um, I mean, as a mediator yourself, what are your thoughts with that? I think it's silly. Why would you say you're just gonna eat meat? Mm -hmm. you're just, it's, it's, it's as silly as, as saying you're just gonna eat plants, unless you have a really strong ethical reason um, or, or a moral obligation that you're tied to, you know, for uh, based on your religious beliefs or something like that, which I can respect. Um, to me, it doesn't make sense, but there's so many good edible plants around. Like, why would you not want to have like a nice, like glazed Brussels sprout with your steak yeah. or, uh, you know, or, or, or have, you know, like I mentioned with your, with your liver, have some garlic and onions and sauteed kale. I mean, mm -hmm. like, why not, why not enjoy the great diversity that God's green earth has to offer versus just like limiting yourself to just eating meat. Now I could see from a health standpoint, if you're very concerned about lectins and you've got some, you know, let's say some inflamed gut issues that might cause you to become like uh, very sensitive to excessive fiber or fermentation in the gut, mm -hmm. um, or you've, you know, you've got, you know, colitis and you can't, you can't process a lot of fiber, you know, something I could see it working out for you for a little while from a health standpoint, mm -hmm. but just from a pure enjoyment of life standpoint and a, diversity of the diet like i want i want my my like raw goat milk with all those wonderful fats and growth hormones and colostrum and i want my uh i, I want my you know like my wild nettle tea that i can go harvest back there and make and the seeds are great for your testosterone the plants are chock full of nutrition and you know i want my my bone-in ribeye steak that i can munch on with you know rosemary and thyme and parsley and other yeah. plants served in along with it and like you know I, I like I'm a total foodie like mm -hmm. I enjoy a lot of different foods like I I, I would never want to just eat a, a plate of chicken versus a platter of chicken pad thai yeah right give me give me the give, give me, me the full meal deal yeah, yeah. I agree hundred yeah. percent give, give me give me the rice noodles and the little pieces of cashew and the carrots and the cabbage and chicken all served up with fish sauce and some salt and some chilies versus just a piece of chicken. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, I agree. Do you eat chicken? I don't eat it much. Uh, why would I not eat chicken? No, I don't know. I mean, I, I just... I love chicken. Yeah, after I, having I like, chickens... You I know what eat. I like to eat is I like to eat, like, uh, I'll go to, you know, um, let's say, oh, perfect example. I was just in LA, right? And mm. I go to Air One. I get like the oh, half yeah. roasted chicken with the bones and I chew the knuckles off the bones and yeah, suck the marrow out. And whenever Jessa makes bone broth, uh, she'll leave the bones in a little bit extra long time mm. for me. And then I take them out and I dump all the bones into a cast iron skillet and I cover them in olive oil mm. and some sea salt and some pepper and some turmeric. Wow. And I just grill them up and I just have for, for lunch, like a big, pile of bones just chew them up oh, you just chew so the knuckles out you suck out the marrow and they taste amazing yeah they nice. melt in your mouth yeah yeah that's cool yeah and then you get the raw goat's milk from your goats in the backyard we don't get it from you those don't. because they're not pregnant right now i see yeah mm -hmm. yeah but you can i mean we're in washington state we can get raw goat's milk raw yeah. cow's milk some company was sending me camel milk for a while which yeah. they claim is like a more thermodynamically available protein and more mm -hmm. nutrient dense and more hypoallergenic than other milks mm -hmm. but uh, there's something about the sustainability of camel's milk that irks me just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Granted, I know I just said I'd fly to Hawaii to hunt, to, right. but but Gotta for, for a staple somewhere. for me to just be drinking only camel's milk, I'm like, eh, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's tasty. Is it? Yeah. yeah. I haven't had it. You know, yeah. goat's milk. We gave it to my daughter. My wife wasn't producing that much breast milk, and it yeah. really helped with her growth. And oh yeah. The raw stuff. Yeah. But it's it's absolutely great, especially for for a kid who can't handle, uh, you know, like a like a cow's milk. The first mm -hmm. time I had camel's milk. There's this great little uh, test, they call it a test kitchen down in Berkeley, California called Mission Heirloom. Mm -hmm. They make amazing food down there and their yeah. kitchen is, you know, it's they use like the finest HEPA air filters and, and, and you know, not a freaking particle of gluten. They work with a lot of people who are on an autoimmune diet, so everything's mm -hmm. very clean. But then they also engage in a lot of molecular gastronomy, like they'll hmm. make a nice wild salmon and then infuse it with it like a syringe with beet juice wow. to make the salmon like dark dark yeah. red and turn it a different color. I had the, the camel's milk down there that they served with like a homemade like 
uh, cricket protein cookie, right? So mm. you're doing cricket protein with camel's milk, yeah. and then they they recently launched like a like an actual restaurant there in there in Berkeley. So they have their kitchen, but then they have a restaurant too. So if you're ever in mm. San Francisco, I've been there or, or Berkeley. Oh, you've yeah. been there? Not 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 the one in San Francisco, but the one in the Berkeley Hills. Yeah, yeah, that I'm one. Sure. It was, it's great. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Shout out to Mission Inland. Yeah. yeah, they're really, really good folks. Um, and then Air One's, like you mentioned too. I mean, I think I've been to like all natural grocery stores all over North America, Canada, and beyond. And I think Air One's tops it for sure. Wouldn't you say? Oh yeah. I mean, if 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 you want a, a tiny little one eighth pound plastic container full of cauliflower for thirty five dollars, <laughs> go to Air One. <laughs> yeah, that's that's really whole paycheck. Granted, their cauliflower buffalo wings are really good. Yeah. I remember the last time I was in uh, L A. I was going to go to a party in the Hollywood Hills. I got invited mm-hmm. to this nice party in the Hollywood Hills. I don't like to show up at parties hungry, yeah. so I stopped by Air One and I got like their rainbow carrots and their their cauliflower wings, and I mm-hmm. did that chicken, you know, the the roasted chicken and had myself a, a nice meal, and I think I had some of the like turmeric golden milk, you yeah. know, the coconut milk and the turmeric, and I'm just feeling great. And I'm like, all right, I could have a have a cocktail up at the party, and I think mm. I'm good. And I show up at the party, and the entire living room is just this massive table, all catered by Erwan. <laughs> Everything yeah. I just bought, I just like all there. Like, right there. Yeah, like, so it. I wound up eating more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a good grocery store. Totally. And I'm yeah, glad there's everything. not one in Spokane. Otherwise, I'd, it'd be a problem. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd spend too much money. <laughs> you guys have Pilgrims, though. I like Pilgrims out here. Pilgrims, yeah. Pilgrims it's a really good nutrition. market. Yeah, my friend Joe Hamilton runs that place. That's a great like little local market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, same good thing. One. Good deli. Good. Uh, the other thing I like at, at Erwan is their butternut squash. Uh, I think it's like a butternut squash lasagna. Hmm. Okay. Super, super good. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to check that out. I'm getting hungry talking to you, dude. Yeah, I know, man. So, I'm getting hungry, too. I, I did eaten. have my big-ass smoothie this morning, you so did. I'm pretty, pretty satiated. Yeah. yeah. I normally, before I do interviews or any cognitive mm-hmm. stuff I don't eat, I'll have like, a little MCT powder. Yeah, I go, like, if it's, like, right, right before, you know, I, like, I ate at, like, 10 a.m. this morning, mm-hmm. and typically for breakfast, I will either do... So I'll make like a, a decaf coffee so I don't get too hyped up from all the other superfoods yeah. that I'll, but I'll heat up a decaf coffee and then I'll, I'll dump the decaf coffee into a, like a Nutribullet. Mm. And then I'll put typically some kind of like a mushroom extract in it, like a Four Sigmatic Chaga mm. or, um, you know, they do like a 10 mushroom blend, some kind of a fat to make it more bioabsorbable, like right. a, an MCT or coconut. I like some, like there's a lot of companies now doing like geese, like, you know, CBD infused mm. geese and adaptogen infused geese. So like a big old spoonful of ghee and a cup of coffee like that. And then I'd use, do a, do a dropper full of that stevia. You saw me just take out yeah. to the sparkling water. It's cool. It's a uh, really good, it's, it's made by a company called Omica Organics. Mm. You have like butterscotch toffee and vanilla flavoring. So I'll put some stevia in there and, um, then a, a scoop full of collagen. Right, like just mm. just like twenty grams or so of collagen, and blend all that up, and that's what I'll have if I'm like in a hurry and I just gotta have breakfast while I'm being interviewed or mm-hmm. something like that. But otherwise, I'll do something similar, but I'll do it all over like a bunch of like frozen bone broth because I'll, I'll freeze bone broth mm-hmm. so that when you make the the smoothie, it it gives you like the texture of of a Wendy's frosty. Mm, and so yeah. I'll do everything I just described to you, but I'll do all that over like a frozen bone broth, blend it all up until it's like this pudding like consistency or like a frosty like consistency. Mm -hmm. And then I'll put like coconut flakes and macadamia nuts or Brazil nuts and like make it super crunchy. And then I eat that like breakfast cereal. That's awesome, that sounds really good. That's what I had this morning. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. Um, I definitely want to get to breakfast and uh, some of the time restricted feeding stuff, but um, I feel like we kind of talked about lectins but didn't dive into it too much. in the sense, so so some people in this world are saying lectins are you know bad, pro-inflammatory, anti-nutrients, and then other folks, uh, John Duyard and others. I don't know if you've interviewed him or come across his yeah, work in Colorado. Yeah. I've known John for a long time. Yeah, mind, body, and sport. Good guy. Yeah. So his yeah. his feeling is like these anti-nutrients, low levels, are like immune stimulants in a yeah, positive like a, way, like a hormetic effect. Yeah. So yeah, where how like do you ascertain? Plants. I completely agree with with John. I mean, unless you have full blown you know, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or colitis mm-hmm. or some kind of pretty intense inflammatory condition. Yeah. Uh, I feel like the hormetic effect of wild plants is fantastic. And you just have to get to the point where you're not going to be a dummy about it. Like I'm not going to, you know, like, like hide up in one of those trees and wait for a deer to pass under me and like jump down and sink my teeth into its backside yeah. and grab it by the horn. I'd die. Like the, the, they're tough animals. They've mm-hmm. got 
you know, swords coming out of their heads and cloven hooves and yeah. it could, could kill you, right? So I'm going to be smart about it and not destroy myself trying to freaking eat it. Plus, you know, and then if I don't cook it, I'm trying to like sink my teeth into its hide and tear. Yeah. tear. I was actually just down in San Jose taking like a self-defense course and they were teaching yes. us how to like rip people's face off with our teeth, Whoa. which was intense, but I that wouldn't do that with, a, a like it wouldn't be a good way to eat, I don't yeah. think. I, don't, I think the cons are the pros of that style of, of eating. Mm. Same thing with like a freaking, you know, like soybean, right? Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna soak it and, you know, mm. and Jessa will like ferment and make natto sometimes and, and actually render it digestible or, you know, wheat. I love wheat. Like Jessa gets a nice, you know, non-GMO red wheat berry from the Palouse and mm. brings it back home and, and makes a slow fermented sourdough which pre-digests the gluten and lowers mm. the glycemic index and renders a plant wheat that has some natural built-in defense mechanisms and would otherwise be undigestible, digestible. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll get quinoa and I used to have quinoa and get stomach aches and think that my body had some kind of a reaction or an allergy against quinoa and I could have written the, whatever, the, the F quinoa book, mm -hmm. right? And that could have been the next big New York <laughs> yeah. Times bestseller, but I'm like, no, you rinse the quinoa and you, and, soak it. And, and you soak it and you get all the saponins off so you remove mm -hmm. that, that soap-like irritant and then you, you, you eat it, yeah. right? So you just have to be, in the same way you have to be smarter than the animal and figure out a way to, to hunt it and, and consume it and cook it. You have to be, without dying, you have to be smarter than the plant and figure out a way to, to ferment it or soak it or sprout it or, you know, even how Stephen Gundry, you, you talked about him, you know, he mm -hmm. gets into like concept of pressure cooking and, you know, there, there are things that we can do to render these, these plants digestible. And, uh, you know, I, I will say there is something to the to the fact that, you know, traditional Italian, you know, you'll see them like remove the skins and the seeds from their tomatoes. And that's probably smart if you're going to do a lot of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think it is it's a little bit blown out of proportion, yeah. a little bit blown out of proportion as far as like the dangers of, of lectins. I think that you should not avoid plants that are high in lectins as much as you should just prepare them properly. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good point. I, I think the context and like the specifics get lost. You know, right. you know, people just hear a podcast, they hear plants are bad, and then they right. go, oh, okay, I'm just going to go all meat or I'm going to go whatever it is. So, yeah, the preparation. But it takes a lot of time, like bringing back yeah. this traditional cooking. And yeah. so, it's human nature. It's understandable, yeah. right? We want simplicity in this day and age with as many things as they're flying at us in the information age. We want to reduce decision-making fatigue. Mm. And for someone to just come up to us and say, hey, just eat meat or yeah. hey don't ever eat lectins it's like that's simple that's mm -hmm. a simple rule to follow but at the same time ultimately i think it paints you into a restrictive corner and sucks some of the yeah. some of the foodie enjoyment out of life mm -hmm. right? i would agree yeah. uh you mentioned like the the homemade sourdough bread and all that sort of stuff with yeah the, um so where do you cycle carbs into the whole thing because i know you're training quite a bit right now uh-huh um and you, I mean, are you, would you say you're keto most of the time or fat adapted? How do you uh, differentiate that? I don't, I don't pay that much attention. Yeah. Um, I, when I was racing, like pretty professionally in Ironman where um, nutrition is pretty important. It's like the fourth discipline, right? Like swim, bike, run, eat. Mm. I found ketosis to be really helpful. It's like a preferred fuel for the diaphragm and the heart and the lungs. And I could go for really, really long times in like an aerobic endurance sustained state. And I followed a, a relatively strict ketogenic diet when I was racing Ironman and doing a lot, a lot of triathlons and endurance sports. Um, now I do a lot more glycolytic type of racing. So I race uh, an obstacle course racing, which might be sprinting and rope climbing and you know hauling two big ass sandbags up a hill and then crawling. So it's, I mean, you know, there's this concept in, uh, it, you, you used to be a cyclist, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so there's a concept in cycling where you'd like burn a match, right? Like trying to pass somebody yeah, or, yeah. You know, uh, same thing in triathlon, right? Occasionally during a 112 mile bike ride, you're still not aerobic the whole time. You still mm -hmm. burn a match, you know, five, six times during that race, passing somebody and going from 250 watts up to, you know, above 500 watts to, to make a, a legal pass within 15 seconds, for example. Mm -hmm. It's just that in Spartan, there's a lot of match burning. Yeah. And so because of that, I haven't found ketosis to be that, that oh, fun of a diet to mm -hmm. be on. And, and honestly, I found it to, to kind of drain you, like not, not just hormonally, you know, I do a lot of self quantification and mm -hmm. look at things like testosterone, which seems to lower when you combine ketosis with, uh, with a very glycolytically demanding sport. Um, same thing for, for thyroid, right? It seems to downregulate thyroid a little bit as well. And you just don't feel that great. Mm -hmm. You know, who wants to go like, 
you know, kick your own ass with kettlebells for an hour and then, you know, in the afternoon do a sprint workout and have uh, like coconut milk and a fat <laughs> bomb for dinner. It's like, you want sweet potato fries and, yeah. and you know, and, and maybe a you know, wine, dark chocolate and, you know, some of, some of Jess's bread with some butter and, you know, and, mm. and almond butter and, you know, and, and garlic sauce on top of it or whatever, right? Like that's, yeah. that's what you want to eat to refill some of the glycogen stores. Uh, and so that's what I do now, but I generally um, stay pretty aware of glycemic variability and try to reduce the number of blood glucose fluctuations that occur during the day. Not only because I feel like I have more stable energy levels when I do that, but because um, there are some, there are some people that swear that, um, insulin surges and glycemic variability and blood glucose fluctuations actually are at the root of a lot of chronic diseases mm -hmm. and are at the root of, uh, enhancing or decreasing longevity. Uh, you know, folks like, uh, Peter Atia or Sammy Inkinen come to mind as, you know, uh, pe people who have, who've talked a little bit about glycemic variability, Sammy being more on the athletic end and Peter being more on the on the health end, but I, but I like that concept of being very hyper aware of how many times your blood glucose is fluctuating during the day. Mm -hmm. And I generally, um, for me in a good day, like I've got zero blood glucose fluctuations until dinner. And what, what I mean by that is I'll have like the breakfast that I just described to you, yeah. which is you know, some protein in there, but not very gluconeogenic. And frankly, I wake up and I do some training anyways. So mm -hmm. I'm somewhat insulin sensitive in the morning just based on chronobiology. Yeah. You have increased insulin sensitivity in the morning, but then if I'm moving in the morning as well and jumping in that dang cold pool outside, like I'm not too concerned about like an insulinogenic response to protein mm -hmm. in the morning causing issues with me not being able to be a fat burning machine or, or throwing my glycemic variability all over the all over the place. Yeah. Um, lunch, again, it's it's either like you know, sometimes I won't have lunch and will instead do like one of those kind of super foodish coffee recipes I talked about. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's just a bunch of plants with, with some seeds and nuts and fats and oils. And so again, not a big mm -hmm. fluctuation there. Um, I'll generally work out again, usually a harder workout because your body temperature peaks and your mm -hmm. reaction time peaks and your grip strength peaks and a lot of those things that make a hard workout uh, better they peak in the afternoon or the early evening. So I do a hard workout in the afternoon or the early evening. In the morning, it's typically more like, you know, um, some some um, form work with the kettlebells mm -hmm. or an easy walk, or like you saw the sauna downstairs, I'll get in the sauna for a half hour and do like some core foundation training or some Eldoa stretching mm -hmm. or some deep breathing, you know, things like that. Uh, but then I'll, I'll do that afternoon workout and I'll go into that workout without having eaten anything since lunch, mm. right? So I'm, again, basically relying upon fats as well as the glycogen from the previous night's dinner, yeah. right? Which has well been incorporated into my, into my liver and my muscles since dinner the night before. So I'll work out and then I'll have carbohydrates with dinner. And usually, you know, I'll finish my workout around 6 or 6.30 and we'll have dinner around 8, right? So I've got kind of a fast between my workout and dinner, which enhances a little bit of a growth hormone and a testosterone release to not, you know, if I were trying to put on mass, I'd eat right away, but I'm mm -hmm. not. So, yeah. so I wait to eat and then I eat and that's when I have my carbohydrates. And so essentially, you know, that's almost like a cyclic ketogenic diet mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm restoring my carbohydrate levels in a period that I have a relatively high amount of insulin sensitivity and a pretty big upregulation of glucose transporters because I've just worked out, right. right? Or at least I've worked out in the past two hours, right? And then, um, and then I will go back into like a lower carb, moderate protein, high fat diet for the next 24 hours, typically with a 12 to 16 hour fast worked in as well, where I've just got, you know, after dinner, I'm, I'm not eating. Mm -hmm. and if I do eat, if I, you know, get up at midnight because I want to go, whatever, have a, you know, a chocolate truffle or whatever, I. I'm a very competitive guy. Like I'll set my watch and I won't eat again till till noon, right? Mm. So I'll, I'll modify Push that the window. Diet. Yeah, not yeah. to be orthorexic, but more to really have patterns in my life that would enhance longevity mm. and also, um, even from a pure performance standpoint, for me, I, I feel like I perform better, especially because, uh, let, let's face it, even even if I'm doing like a three mile long Spartan race, that's not a it's not a hundred meter sprint, right? Like it's still like an endurance type of activity that has a pretty strong aerobic nature to it. Mm -hmm. And I just feel better from a mitochondrial standpoint an aerobic standpoint and a performance standpoint when I follow a diet similar to what I've just described to you. But 
I'm careful when I say that word diet, right? Like yeah. it's not a diet in that I'm being that restrictive. I eat a wide variety of food groups. It's just, I look at my macros and my nutrient timing pretty intensively. Mm -hmm. But you're not tracking or calculating. You're just eating intuitively more so. I use, well, I used to do bodybuilding where I yeah. track a lot and I, you know, I got to know how like 81 calories in yeah. a banana and exactly how many calories, fats and protein were in my chicken, white rice and broccoli, right? Mm -hmm. In the Tupperware container that I'd take to work each day along with my yogurt, my apple, my three protein shakes and my <laughs> rice bag cakes. of nuts and yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, my two rice cakes. Um, and you know, after being a bodybuilder and tracking that stuff intensively for like a year and a half, I got my head wrapped pretty well around like how many calories I'm getting per day and occasionally I'll like, I'll, I'll lay awake at night and I'll think, okay, well, how many calories did I, did I have today if I mm -hmm. add this up? And it is always like, I don't, I don't keep, I don't, I don't do this purposefully, but it always comes out to like somewhere between 3000 and 3,500 calories. Yeah. That's just like how many calories I eat each day, just intuitively, right? Mm -hmm. It's intuitive eating, but if I sit down and actually calculate it and it also comes out to about 50 to 60% fat, mm. 20 to 30% protein. Mm -hmm. And then depending on how hard I've worked out that day and the anticipated demands of the next day, 10 to 30% carbohydrate with the mm. higher percentage of the carbohydrates coming on the more active days. That works for me, yeah. right? Somebody who's got uh, familial hypercholesteremia or you know, poor saturated fat sensitivity or something like that, they might do better on like a ketamine based diet of 70%, you know, healthy starches and, you know, 10 to 20% fat and 10 to 20% protein. Mm -hmm. right? So, but that's what works for me yeah. as a, you know, pretty average American mutt slash Northern European. Right. But you're active and doing a lot, thermal stress, meditating, mm -hmm. you know, two different exercise, you know, sessions during the day. You know, going back to the post-workout window, because the dogma for a long time in fitness and nutrition is like, you got to have your, your, especially replenishing glycogen too, in that 30 minute window. And then you got to increase muscle protein synthesis eating. Mm. And what I heard you say right there, and I think, I know a lot of people that are shifting to not eating after they work out. It may be in that two hour window. What are your thoughts? I mean, if someone's trying to maintain hypertrophy. Yeah. So the protein synthesis piece, yeah, you do get amplified protein synthesis in that post-workout window. Mm -hmm. um, during which time, like consuming an insulinogenic protein can enhance recovery and it can enhance uh, repair, it can enhance muscle hypertrophy if that's something that you're going for. But that is all based on research of people in a, in a state of low blood levels of amino acids preferably or, or, or not preferably, but typically with a, uh, with a hard workout in the morning in a fasted state, mm. right? When we take that and we bring it to the streets where someone's had a big lunch and like a 4 p.m. workout where their blood levels of amino acids are already elevated, there's a far reduced need for that elevation of blood amino acids to enhance protein muscle synthesis post-workout. Mm -hmm. And you remain in a relatively insulin sensitive state for, I mean, in some cases, depending on the, on, the, uh, on the intensity of the workout up to 24 hours mm -hmm. after the actual workout, which means that, that that window is longer than what we've been led to believe. That muscle protein synthesis window is longer than what we've been led to believe unless you really are in a fasted state with very low blood levels of amino acids. And mm -hmm. essentially it comes down to the fact that if you're still burping up your pre-workout meal, there's no need for you to set everything down and consume a post-workout meal unless yeah. you're a freaking high school football player trying to put on mm -hmm. 20 pounds or you're a bodybuilder trying to maintain muscle mass or something like that. I will still remain somewhat cognizant of that, that idea of muscle protein synthesis and the mm -hmm. fact that it all comes down to blood levels levels of amino acids and I will use sometimes in that facet window post-workout uh, or if I wake up in a facet state and I am gonna and I do this when I travel sometimes or like I've yeah. only got one chance to work out when I travel I'm at a conference so I, I just crush it in mm -hmm. the morning right I don't wait till the afternoon because there is no you know you, you're at a conference it's like everybody wants to go to lunch dinner, and then dinner and yeah, yeah. You know, there, there is no time you always think there's gonna be and there isn't and so I will do something like consume amino acids, right? Kind of, kind of hack it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not drawing a bunch of blood into my digestive tract, but I'll do like an essential amino acids blend. Use that before or after the workout to boost blood levels of amino acids mm -hmm. and still get the growth hormone and the testosterone benefits of not eating a lot of calories post workout. Yeah. Uh, the other thing regarding carbohydrates, it's very similar. Uh, what research has shown is that if you exercise in a fasted state to glycogen depletion, mm -hmm. which is pretty tough, you gotta work out hard for like 90 minutes to yeah. glycogen deplete, then it would serve you from a recovery standpoint to consume carbohydrates in that post-workout state to refill glycogen levels. Uh, similarly, even if you are working out and you're not in a fasted state and it's not to glycogen depletion, but you're gonna work out again within the next eight hours, 
Research has also shown that that would be a scenario in which post-workout carbohydrate will replenish what normally would not be replenished over that eight hour period. Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes at least eight hours for you eating ad libitum to restore muscle glycogen levels and liver glycogen levels. So what this means is that if you are, um, you're a two a day worker outer and your two a day is like a morning and a two or 3 p.m. which is separated by fewer than eight hours, you would actually wanna eat carbohydrates in the morning after yeah. workout if you wanted to enhance your performance as much as possible in the afternoon workout. Or if you're a swimmer in a swim meet or you know a, a um, a tennis player in a, in a tournament where you've got three matches during the day, that would be a scenario where after every single one of your competitions, you actually would want to knock down like half a sweet potato or, you know, consume like a, like a, whatever, a maltodextrin fructose whey protein blend or, or do something to replenish mm -hmm. glycogen levels. So it, it, it ultimately depends, but context if you're coming specific, at it, yeah. it's very context specific, very performance specific. Yeah. And most people that are trying to lose weight are not in that, in that camp, right? Where they're doing two day workouts, maybe yeah. they're, you know. Yeah. Like, most people in it for the longevity yeah. or the weight loss game, they, uh, assuming they're not incredibly lean and assuming that like a morning fasted workout is not a very stressful, hard morning fasted workout. And even in that case, you could use something like the amino acids trick that I just described. Mm -hmm. um, you actually get, the, the, let's, let's put this way, there's more pros uh, than cons to restricting food after workout and also working out in a fasted state and restricting carbohydrates most of the day until yeah. the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good tip. You know, I found, I mean, when I was training a lot, high volume, like 20, 25 hours a week cycling and all that, like mm -hmm. it made me fat. Uh, you know, doing all these post-workout shakes and worrying about all that stuff. It was just right. easier to just, you know, be more intuitive about the whole thing and, and eat, you know, you know, if you're not hungry, most people are not hungry after they work out. Yeah, they yeah, exactly. To, exactly. That's like, the other thing is you're not hungry after you work out and that might possibly be a built-in human signal that maybe you don't need to eat after work out. And part of that is that, you know, that Cori cycle where, especially if you've worked out hard, I mean, that's one of the best ways to quell your appetite is drop and do 30 burpees, mm -hmm. right? You generate a bunch of lactic acid that activates the Cori cycle. A lot of that gets converted into glucose. I mean, you kind of, you, you almost like create your own biochemical internal snack yeah. when, you, when you do something like that. So yeah, yeah, exercise is a great appetite suppressant. Yeah, good tip. Going back to testosterone reduction and uh, thyroid reduction, what do you think the mechanisms are that are associated with being in a ketogenic type state? Do you think it's just like calorie deprivation or are there other mechanisms? Oh, the thyroid might be actually a, a reduction in the amount of glucose availability for conversion of T4 to active T3. Hmm. And so you get a pretty steep upregulation in TSH yeah. uh, based on the drop in T3. I suspect that's what's happening with the thyroid. Um, with, uh, with, you know, and, and you see a similar thing happen with, with long-term calorie deprivation without mm -hmm. refeeds, which is why we see a lot of these diets, like the most recent study that came out on the energy restriction diet, where it's literally energy restriction with, with timed refeeds. Like every couple of weeks, you actually do a, a day or a period of time where you're, where you're eating ad libitum, restoring mm -hmm. calories. And, you know, I don't like to use the word starvation mode too much because it's thrown around too much in our industry, but you can get to the point where excessive calorie deprivation, especially over a period of time longer than four weeks, can downregulate thyroid mm -hmm. and, and cause an increase in TSH. Yeah. Testosterone, um, I suspect that that's the same thing that we see in like female athlete triad, where it's a downregulation of fertility due to not enough hormone precursors because mm -hmm. there's simply not enough building blocks. I know that sounds like a really simple, stupid explanation, mm -hmm. but I mean, you just have to have X amount of calories to, to make stuff, right. right? Your body has to make stuff. And so, um, testosterone is one of those things that takes a hit because why would, why would nature want you to make babies when you're in a constantly stressed and calorie depleted state, right? Mm -hmm. So you see an upregulation in cortisol accompanied by an upregulation in sex hormone binding globulin. Maybe your Leydig cells are still producing testosterone. So total testosterone is elevated or at least normal, but free testosterone is tanked very common pattern yeah. that you see in people who are on like a, a high fat, low carb slash calorie restricted diet, um, doing a lot of exercise. Hmm. I was thinking too, a part of it may be like the, um, osmotic, uh, potential within the, in the blood and so forth that maybe there's just more sensitivity to the hormones. Potentially. I was kind of thinking about that because, mm -hmm. you know, we do see a, a dramatic increase in the amount of salt people need and more insulin sensitivity. So I was thinking that, that there could be other factors, like in addition to what you're saying about just the energy and energy. Yeah. Out. Are you saying that maybe your testosterone levels are just fine, but you're seeing higher turnover of testosterone? Potentially. Yeah. So it's like physiologically, cause it's, it's not like people feel 
like their sex drive drops. I mean, I haven't heard that very often from people that are on long-term ketogenic style diet, but you know, their free or total T can drop. You know, so it's you wonder what's going on at the kind of the yeah. cellular molecular level. Yeah, I've gotten the Dutch test in that mm. scenario, and it has correlated with my blood panels. Mm. And I've also, uh, with that ketogenic high volume training thing, seen a very big drop in libido and drop in sex drive. Mm. And so I think that there's probably some scenarios, uh, especially in the absence of high volume exercise on a ketogenic diet, where a drop in testosterone might not actually reflect a, a true drop in testosterone and might be like a more, like you just alluded to, more rapid turnover of testosterone metabolites or something like that. But mm -hmm. I think in a, in, in a high volume exercising individual on a ketogenic slash calorie restricted diet, it's a true drop in, te yeah. in testosterone. And I just say that based off what I personally experience symptomatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's move on to and, the brain. And by the way, it's a huge issue. Yeah. You don't even want, like, cause I do a lot of consulting with a lot of these athletes and I mean like, yeah. The number of dudes walking around with hypogonadism and the number of women who haven't had a period in months and months in the in like the triathlon, Spartan racing, marathoning, swimming, cycling industry is like, it's it's more people than not in mm -hmm. that state. Totally. Yeah. And you attribute that part of it is the, the stress of the exercise, but also the diet too? Yeah. yeah. Keto it's, stuff? It's, it's both. Because yeah. it's a population that tends to be kind of orthorexic too. Yeah. Right. Very type A, calorie restriction, pays attention to diets, mm -hmm. listens to all these silly podcasts about yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, another area that you focus on a lot, I mean, we, you've hit on it multiple times, longevity and, and, you know, cognitive preservation. And I know you've experimented a lot with photobiomodulation and, and you know, other tactics. Um, it seems like the barrier to entry to some of these tools is quite expensive. And, and like, where, mm -hmm. where does, like, if someone is like, all right, I've, now I'm managing my stress. I'm doing thermo, you know, cold thermogenesis. I'm doing sauna mm -hmm. therapy. I'm exercising. I want to move on to more like cognitive preservation. Where would you guide people to? It's not expensive to live a lifestyle that enhances longevity. And we could look at any of the blue zones to see that, mm -hmm. right? We would see consumption of tannin rich beverages, which are pennies on the dollar on Amazon, or if you want to get your tannins or to go outside and pick some dandelion and yeah. for free in the backyard and make some dandelion tea. Uh, exposure to near and far infrared via adequate sunlight exposure is mm. also free or relatively cheap. Um, you know, relationships, love, life, laughter, good clean water, real food, all of that is completely sustainable on, on a budget, mm -hmm. a pretty serious budget. Yeah. Um, when we look at all these biohacks, near and far infrared light panels like are in my office, um, hypoxic combined with hyperoxic oxygen therapy or hyperbaric mm -hmm. oxygen therapy to concentrate oxygen and enhance concentration of mitochondria or, or mitochondrial density. Uh, we look at um, stem cells, right? Stem cell extraction and reinjection or you know, via fat or bone or the use of embryonic or umbilical stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, concentrated sirtuin rich powders uh, that also typically include a lot of stem cell precursors, right? Blueberry combined with cacao, combined with um, powdy arco, algae, colostrum, uh, coffee berry fruit extract, you know, all, all these adaptogens, you know, things that cost a lot that come mm. in a canister. That's like your longevity canister. Um, uh, saunas, right? Like, like heat stress, cryotherapy, and very expensive, like, you know, nitrogen-based cryotherapy chambers. Um, a lot of those things exist uh, for um, three reasons, in my opinion, in, in kind of like our modern, uh, somewhat health infatuated and, and longevity infatuated culture. Uh, number one would be we are fighting an uphill battle in a post-industrial era, meaning that if I live in, um, in an area that, that doesn't have a lot of the a lot of the dirty electricity and pollution and heavy metal and poor food and, and stress is a big one and mm -hmm. sleep issues and you know fluorescent lighting and, and all these things that, that are just present all the time, I'm far less likely to need to go really far out of my way to introduce all these little hacks to basically undo the damage, right? Like honestly, half the stuff I do, I do because I'm traveling yeah. like two weeks out of every month. Wow. I get exposed to a huge amount of both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. Mm -hmm. um, I, my chronobiology just goes to crap. Like if I didn't do a lot of the things that I do, like, you know, yesterday I, I, had, I, I had just gotten home from being gone six days down in California. My first workout was hypoxia, hyperoxia, 
uh, followed by sauna, followed by uh, that, that free radical or reactive oxygen species generator that you saw on my desk mm -hmm. while I was bathed in near and far infrared light. And you know, I tracked my heart rate variability and tracked my bloods and, and those kind of things helped me survive mm. travel yeah. and, you know, and, and all, this, all the stress that comes with it. Uh, and so the first reason that a lot of this stuff exists and, and hence our current infatuation with it is because many of us, especially in the areas such as like a, a first world country where a lot of that stuff exists, we really are just like constantly bombarded, bombarded yeah. by things that require us. We're, we're living in a relatively unnatural state and sometimes you need unnatural means to to mitigate some of that damage. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one reason. We're, we're basically trying to use better living through science to undo some of the damage from the lifestyle that we've chosen to live, right? Like I make good money and I live a convenient lifestyle doing what I do. I'm able to spread my message far more rapidly when I'm hopping on planes and you know, fulfilling my purpose, but at the same time, there are downsides to that. If mm -hmm. I just decided I was gonna stay in Spokane, at home, maybe help my wife out in the garden and um, you know, maybe, maybe I'd go out there and, and my job would be harvesting, harvesting, you know, wood and selling that to my neighbors, mm -hmm. right? Like I wouldn't do all these biohacks cause I wouldn't need to right? yeah, be outside sure. sunshine, fresh air, but yep. uh, I, I just, you know, that's not my life. Right. So that's number one. Um, number two would be that there certainly is a, a large industry and a lot of capitalism mm -hmm. built up around the supplement industry, um, built up around the the new you know biohacking industry, you know near and far infrared light panels that cost eight hundred dollars versus going out in the sunshine for yeah. free. Um, it's just sexy, right? Like we get attracted to novelty mm -hmm. as as humans. We just like shiny pennies. You know, it's like rats pressing a little tab yeah. to get more cocaine. There's a kind of a cool dopamine release, and I don't have anything against that. It mm -hmm. is fun. Like it's fun for me to go down to my little force plate and tie it to my phone and look at how much force I'm generating when I'm doing a hard workout versus just like walking over to that door and pushing gets it as hard as I can for 60 seconds. Yeah. Like once, yeah. I once I tie a phone in, I'm pushing and you know, it's an official workout and I'm following the little program that the guy sent me, like, right. like then it's, it's interesting, it's, mm -hmm. it's fun. And, and there's honestly a certain amount of capitalism and, and an industry built up around the idea that we find this stuff to be sexy and fun, not just yeah. necessary in terms of our battle against like this, you know, this uphill battle for health and longevity living in a post-industrial area, but it's also just, it's, it's fun. It's yeah. interesting, right? It creates yeah, a conversation, and competitiveness yeah. with people and- Right, you right, know? exactly. So that, that'd be another reason. And then finally, um, there was the, there's the convenience factor, right? Yeah. There's the better living through science factor. There's mm. the idea that I can go and, and live on a pristine Himalayan mountaintop out in the fresh air and just get wonderful oxygen. And that would take weeks out of my life and I'd have to get an airplane. I'd have to go find the Himalayas, wherever those are, and just like go, go through a lot to, yeah. to get to that. I could also spend 24 hours in a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber and cut that amount of time down drastically. I could finally do a 15 minute workout downstairs on that machine I showed you in my office mm -hmm. and simulate the effects of a hyperbaric oxygen therapy chamber for a day. Right, so we, we go down that convenience rabbit hole. It's like, right. hey, I got X amount of time, I wanna squeeze X amount of fun and family and enjoyment and travel and adventure in my life. Why not engage in better living through science mm -hmm. and uh, get all my nutrients in one fell swoop in my morning smoothie and get all my oxygen in 15 minutes on my little training routine and compress an entire day's worth of fitnessing into a single high intensity workout in the sauna with heat therapy versus going outside and you know, whatever, going on a, on a hike for four hours in the sunshine, like, right. which sounds silly to a lot of people. There are a lot of people, including my wife somewhere around here, who mm -hmm. would just say, yeah, I'm going on a hike, screw that. Yeah, right. But uh, I, you know, for, for me, for the, for the convenience, the fact that it helps me to fight the uphill battle against the life that I've chosen, and the fact that it's just kind of freaking fun and, and interesting, those would be the three reasons that, that I, I do a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Out of all the things that you mentioned, right, the environmental toxins, the Wi-Fi, the you know, fluorescent lights that are on the streets of, of a lot of people, um, what do you think is the highest hit rate in terms of affecting our health? Smartphones, without a doubt, without a doubt, dude. I mean, yeah. like, in terms of everything from the, the warning labels that are on them that tell you not to have them near mm -hmm. touching 
your skin to the, the host of data. I mean, there's, there's very compelling data now in terms of uh, carcinogenicity, um, you know, calcium channel leakage. I'm sure you've seen like, you know, Dr. Martin Paul's and Dietrich Klinghart's research on that kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, Mercola is a great champion of that research uh, uh, in, in terms of getting it out there. Dr. Mercola, um, Nicholas Pennault has a new book about the non, it's called the non tinfoil hat guide to EMFs where he does a really great job laying out a lot of that research. Mm. Um, it's everywhere. Yeah. You can't get away from it even if you put your own phone in airplane mode. So I would say even more than like Wi-Fi routers and Fukushima radiation and, and you know, heavy metals from car keys and Chinese toys, like just the prevalence of smartphones, uh, the addictiveness of them, the fact that even really healthy people still struggle. I still struggle mm -hmm. with that, right? Yeah. Like, and, and some of it is completely illogical, right? Like you're, when, when your calcium channels are wide open and there's this influx of calcium which causes a, a subsequent rise in, infl in inflammation cells and you know that a smartphone and a smartphone signal and especially a 4G signal can very intensively do that and at the same time I know that something like pulsed electromagnetic field therapy can help that because because it, 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 it actually activates the ability of a cell to be able to engage in more of that anti-inflammatory cleanup mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. But if you combine the two and you get exposed to like a smartphone or the electricity and you do PMF at the same time, it's like the, the worst of, of both worlds. Mm. But like just this morning, I was down on that PMF unit, right, in the office and um, I was down there and I was reading and my cell phone was sitting across from me and I reached for my cell phone and I flipped it on to check, I, I, was like, I, was, yeah, I was looking for a message from, yeah. I just thought of it, like, I gotta check for this message. Yeah. But I'm thinking about it and I'm like, dude, I'm like effing up my body more than even if I just reached for the cell phone and I were mm -hmm. in bed or, or outside, you know, and, and I caught my cell phone, I put it back, but you know, I'm pretty damn cognizant of this stuff. And even, even I, you know, yeah. will, I'm not saying that to be like hubristic or narcissistic, but yeah, I still have a hard time when I'm laying upstairs in bed, remembering like, okay, just like, you're gonna, be sorry about it in the morning if you Look. get on your phone because you know your sleep cycles aren't going to be as good, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, smartphones, dude, not just because of the proven research behind them and the prevalence of them, but the addictiveness of them even for, for healthy people. And it's, it's so profound. Yeah, that book, uh, Irresistible by Adam Alter, have you read that? Uh -huh. I'm sure. No. Yeah, he, no. he talks about, I mean, the whole book, you think it's going to be all about the, the phones, but it's about behavioral right. addictions and how right. these are just one big Right. So, so right here, here's my phone. It's mm -hmm. in airplane mode, right? Mm -hmm. It's in airplane mode most of the time. But I mean, like, you know, the research shows that by this phone simply being here, I'm less present with you. Yeah. I am like, I could, I could take this phone and whatever, chuck, chuck it over there, mm -hmm. you know, go like this. And just me doing that. Yeah. I'm suddenly more present right. with you. Yeah. Just knowing that's not there. That yeah. slight 1% of my mind that's like, what box or yeah, email I that touch. am I getting right now? <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Is everything okay? Like, right. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's so profound. And so how do you manage that? You have a nine-year-old, two nine-year-old boys. Um, I'm sure they want to get on the phone and play. Um, my six-year-old loves to get, nothing more than to get on YouTube. So how do you manage that? Because you want them to like, you know, be able to yeah. navigate. Um, our kids recently got an eye touch and I've educated them very intensively uh, since they were young about mm -hmm. the effects of Wi-Fi radiation on like their, their balls and their growing brains and their rapidly dividing neurons. Yeah. Um, taught them about the effects of screens on circadian biology in a way that a child can understand, right? Mm -hmm. You won't sleep as well, you won't have as good a time as school if you're, you know, if you're reading dad's Kindle tonight instead of your paper book or we're messing around on the, on the phone or we go to the movie theater, you know, like maybe twice a year mm -hmm. and they always bring their blue light blocking glasses because right? nice. I set an example and I've yeah. got mine and they know that it helps their sleep cycles. You know, you can see them outside, right? They're yeah, playing they're out playing. in the snow, that's what so they awesome. do. Yeah. They don't really, they don't know how to use a computer very well. Um, until I bought them an eye touch, it took them a long time before they could figure out like how to turn it on, much mm -hmm. less like figure out how to connect it to an internet or download an app. There's no Wi-Fi in our house. So nice. You can't yeah. connect to anything anyways. Um, so yeah, we, we've sacrificed a little bit in that our Luddite-ish um, when it comes to the use of technology. And I'm not concerned about that. I know mm -hmm. they'll figure it out. I figured yeah. it out, right? Yeah. Like I pretty much, my entire business is run on technology and I didn't own anything but like the cheapest of flip phones until about four years ago, mm -hmm. right? So um, I'm not that worried and if they ever wanted an iPhone, if they ever want to get on YouTube, if they ever want to use Wi-Fi, um, 
if they ever want to open up that alcohol cupboard and drink as much booze as they want, that's their decision. Mm -hmm. My role as a parent is to simply educate them about the consequences rather than make that a forbidden fruit. Yeah. And so that's what I've done is I educate them about Wi-Fi, about Bluetooth, about airplane modes, about if you are going to use a device, like the organs to keep it away from, your brain and your balls, mm -hmm. um, and then let them make the decision and knock on wood so far mm -hmm. when we're looking up something after dinner, they go upstairs and they grab their blue light blocking glasses before they come down and look That's at awesome. the computer. They automatically put the phone in airplane mode when mm -hmm they have the phone and they're using it for anything aside from like calling grandma or something like that. And yeah. even then they know not to hold it. It sits on the table, it's on speaker mode in front of them. So an important thing is that I practice what I preach and I, I make that evident for them, but then I also try and educate them on why I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah, So well that's a really good approach. Yeah. Is that like kind of a love and logic type format or? I don't know. I, don't, my, I have some friends that are really into that book. I haven't read it yet. Yeah. You've probably heard of it, Love and Logic. It sounds familiar. Yeah. It sounds familiar. No, it's just like, it's, to me, it's just logical. Common it's sense, like, yeah. Because I didn't grow up that way, right? Like, my first encounter with alcohol was the bottle of whiskey one of my dad's friends gave him, and I didn't know what it was, and all I knew was we didn't, we, we don't do that. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't drink alcohol. And so my first experience with alcohol was just getting, getting drunk yeah. out of my mind at 16 years old, the bottle of whiskey that I stole from my dad mm -hmm. in my bedroom. Like, Versus my kids, and they you know they sip wine, and they yeah. taste whiskey, and you know I'd, somebody just sent me uh, you got a like a really, there's a really good bottle of tequila in there. I recently wrote an article for Men's Health in which they wanted yeah. me to try out all like the popular hangover remedies, mm. and I wrote the article. But then these alcohol companies started sending me all the booze that you see over there, so I got like this cover for booze. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that tequila, it's really good. Like mm. I, I don't think I've ever owned like a really really nice bottle of tequila. Mm -hmm. So at night I've been like taking the tequila, I put a little sparkling water, squeeze a lemon, a pinch of sea salt in there, and yeah. And it's good, it's amazing. And you know, I poured a half of a shot glass and gave it to both my boys. Yeah. Social worker alert. Hopefully none right. come knocking on the door after I say this. Right. And, you know, they took a little sip, they're like, yeah, I don't like, I don't like tequila. Yeah. If I can also tell you, they're not gonna steal that bottle and go up to the room, you know, because dad told them, don't touch my tequila. That's, right. that's illegal, right? Like it's, yeah, so. It's so a that's, good point. Approach. I had some that's friends that were uh, really guarded growing up. We had a liquor cabinet in, in my house too. Right. So it wasn't, I was kind of over it by the time high school came, and, and the, in contrast, friends that didn't have that, when they got into college, some of them flunked out because they got really into it. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a, a good approach. Just, it's almost like microdosing a little bit, you know, when they're younger, so it's not so novel. And, yeah, I mean, you know, they say that about gluten, right? Children with small exposures to gluten versus the 100% gluten free. Gluten is the devil. Mm -hmm. You know, we, there's not going to be a drop of even the best of non-GMO wheat in our, in our house ever, those children wind up with some pretty gnarly gluten intolerances, whereas the kids who get a little bit of gluten, a little bit of peanut, a little bit of dairy, you know, a lot yeah. of those things that, you know, in, in their natural formats, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, give your kids Snickers bars and 2% milk and, and Wonder Bread, but, you know, natural versions of a lot of these things, the kids yeah. wind up growing up being more tolerant to them. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Finishing so, up on so my- So the takeaway would be give your kids tequila and they will yes. not grow up to be alcoholics. It's like, yeah. Pretty sure that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know your kids want to come in. So just a few uh, kind of parting questions, but I know if you're comfortable talking about like microdosing LSD and psilocybin, different mushrooms and all that as a way to kind of accelerate the, the mindfulness or more spiritually aware journey on that to fit into this whole spectrum of, of health and well-being. Yeah. You know, LSD is a synthetic chemical and, you know, it, it, it can certainly send you to some pretty interesting places when taken in the dosages that, you know, people would have traditionally used LSD in like the 60s, you know, 100 plus micrograms, which would be what we would call a, a trip dose. Mm -hmm. But in smaller doses, you know, as I'm sure you've read about and a lot of the listeners have heard now, you know, a lot of Silicon Valley execs are doing this to, to merge left and right brain hemispheres to enhance creativity, um, to enhance lateral thinking patterns, problem solving abilities. Uh, microdosing with, excuse me, 10 to 20 milligrams of LSD, or there are even better things than that now, like PLSD, for example. Mm. And, you know, companies like uh, Lysergy that that are you know making things that aren't necessarily intended for human consumption, but that you can get that give a pretty good effect without having to like uh, get access to the dark web and cryptocurrency yeah. and everything to get your LSD or go 
park outside of a high school and <laughs> try, <laughs> try and land a, land, a, land a deal with the, with the kid who looks like he's got some. Yeah. Um, so LSD is good for that. Psilocybin, I think because it's a little more natural, a little less synthetic, mm-hmm. very good for increasing alertness and awareness in like a nature experience, like for a hike. Yeah. You notice the veins on leaves and the water droplets coming off of a plant and the the you know swaying of a tree and a lot of times you know some things in nature if you take just a little bit more than a microdose like a microdose would be like 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams you get around a gram or so you know nature starts to kind of come alive and talk to you a little bit mm-hmm. um you know i've got uh, uh tomorrow i actually have a synthetic of uh, of dmt you know mm-hmm. so much of the spirit molecule mm-hmm. i'm gonna try some of that tomorrow night um in the sauna and it's not dmt right like it's a a synthetic analog of it similar to like plsd interesting but um what i would get out of that is i would have a journal out and right now this week i'm working a lot on really clearly identifying and solidifying my purpose Mm -hmm. i'm reading a really great book right now called the way of the superior man Mm. and in it he gets into uh, the importance of purpose, and I'm realizing as I read the book that uh, my purpose is is not as hardwired in my mind as I would like for it to be. And I found in some cases, like going a little bit deeper into plant medicine or things like DMT, that, that it can it can help me a little bit become more aware of uh, um, what it is that that my soul deeply craves and desires when it comes to the mark that I want to make in the world. Mm-hmm. Right. So I would take an even deeper dive into something like that to achieve that effect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of folks use it as a crutch. I would caution folks in the same way you wouldn't want to be dependent upon coffee to be able to write a good blog post or to be able to function well at work or to be able to really get through a hard meeting. Don't become dependent on it. But as long as you're not using it as a crutch, um, it can it can certainly provide you with a little bit of a cognitive advantage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, LSD, uh, psilocybin. Um, you can microdose with iboga, which is also a very interesting one. Um, ketamine. Uh, yeah, I mean a lot of these things that that are far less toxic than alcohol, yeah. and result in far less metabolic damage than alcohol, um, with a lot better effects. I think are you know they're vilified. To a certain extent, because of the their abuse and mm-hmm. the fact that in large amounts they can be a lot more dangerous than alcohol, yeah. or um, I don't shouldn't say more dangerous, maybe as dangerous. Um, they're easier to abuse, right? Because you need smaller amounts. Mm-hmm. You know, alcohol, it's you, yeah, yeah. You got to have a pretty good freaking party to to get drunk. Whereas mm-hmm. LSD, you take twice as much of that tiny little blotter tab than you planned on and you're off in la la the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. right? So you gotta be careful with it. Right. But but yeah, I think microdosing can certainly be effective. Yeah, I've noticed that it helps um, connect with people on a different level that you're not maybe aware of initially. Um, mostly that you know the LSD and then and then the mushrooms, but the uh, the DMT I think is, is really powerful. I mean just I've only had one experience. Um, so you've done like ayahuasca before or in the DMT? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, did you go to Peru and do that or no. Like on a, with a shaman type deal, or I'm not gonna say where I did yeah. it because I always want to respect people. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yes, and you know that's obviously a deeper experience. Mm-hmm. A lot of people find it to be uh, unpleasant, vomiting, purging, um, interaction with with dark spirits or or disturbing entities. Mm-hmm. For me, it was nothing but pleasant. I do have a rule in my life. You know, I'm a Christian, and I live by the biblical rule that I don't. I don't do what is called go to bed on my anger, right? Like I, mm. I really make sure that all my relationships in life are, are really, really solid, and that I've I've mended any any issues with anger or bitterness or or things that people might hold against me or things that I might hold against people, and so I don't tend to walk around with a lot of baggage. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't I don't have a lot. I'm 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 pretty simple when it comes to like you know baggage and emotions yeah. and. I think that helped me when I did ayahuasca and DMT because for me it was extremely pleasant. Mm-hmm. It was extremely pleasant. I, I went to a deep, deep, uh, fractal, extremely bright, lit place, saw God, um, talked to God, mm-hmm. became extremely aware of God's presence, uh, felt wonderful, came out, big smile on my face. And Yeah, I uh, had a little bit of a different experience. That, um, but yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you do have you know, past hurts or, or anything like that, that's definitely gonna come yeah. out for people. Um, yeah. Interesting. Gosh, Ben, we could talk all day about this, all these different things, but we have three final questions we have to ask every guest on the show. Uh, the first one, you yeah. already kind of talked about it, your morning routine. What's, you know, okay. that successful people have habits, routines, right. rituals. Right. What is your day What is like? my morning routine? Well, I mean, it's, it's honestly, you know, we could, we could fill up a whole podcast with it, but yeah. I would say uh, some of the staples I wouldn't get rid of would be I wake up and I gratitude journal. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, 
Um, I do some deep tissue work on the foam roller while the coffee is heating up. Once the coffee's ready, I'll, I'll grab a cup and head downstairs to about 20 minutes of deep work. You mm -hmm. know, typically I've got some crazy probe in my nose or infrared light shining mm -hmm. on me. You know, and then I'll, uh, I'll go use the restroom. And probably the one part of my morning routine that I just, I really, really dig. And I try to replicate this in some semblance when I'm traveling too with just like hot, cold contrast therapy or just like a five minute shower where I've got my underwater MP3 player on and I'm you know going hot 20 seconds or, or, or hot 10 seconds, cold 20 seconds back mm -hmm. and forth. But I do uh, about 20 to 30 minutes in the sauna and then about five minutes out in that cold pool outside. Nice. And I just feel amazing. Like, yeah. Uh, amazing. Makes a so, big difference. So yeah, big, big one for me would be 20 to 30 minutes of heat and a pretty intense sweat followed mm -hmm. by about two to five minutes of a pretty intense cold. Mm. Like that's just a good way to start the day. Yeah, good yeah, definitely. The day. Do you have a high heat? I know you have the infrared. Uh -huh. But do you, I notice a difference, like the neurocognitive benefits with like a really high heat sauna, like a, like wood a dry sauna, sauna? Yeah, yeah, like a wood sauna. They do get more warm. I heat, I heat that sauna up though for a good 30, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'll get up to 158 degrees. The infrared penetrates pretty deeply. Um, a lot of times I go in warm, right? Like you could do 30 burpees, you mm -hmm. could do a quick workout or whatever. Sometimes I'll use that that Live O2 hypoxic machine in my office, do like okay. a 15 minute hit workout on the bike, then get in the sauna. Um, so That's I find if I go in hot and I heat it up, like I can get pretty dang hot. Yeah. And you know, when I travel, you know, some of my friends in Malibu, they're big time into the sauna scene, mm -hmm. you know, like, uh, you know, Neil Strauss and Laird Hamilton and Rick Rubin and all these guys, whenever I, I hang with them, like they're freaking in the sauna every single night in that mm -hmm. dry sauna for like an hour, hour and a half. And, yeah. Um, yeah, different effects, different effect. Higher EMF though in dry sauna too. So you you think be, so? Yeah. What, where is it coming yeah. from? Yeah, that, that big thing that plugs in, the big, um, the, the stove yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah, those have high EMF. High yeah, EMF, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do try and sit away from that. Yeah. I have heard that just intuitively. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's a few saunas in Canada where it's like actually a wood stove within the sauna. That's yeah. my favorite. Yeah. Do you know that's, and I it gets up to like 220 yeah. degrees. Yeah. So. Uh, crazy. All right. So you're stranded on a desert island. Vitamin D and omega threes are covered. What well, herb, nice. nutrient, botanical are you bringing with you? Somebody's just there at the island already with my vitamin D mm -hmm. and my omega threes. Just ready, waiting. Those are two <laughs> things I want to experiment uh, macro dosing with. One of my friends mm -hmm. I was talking with yesterday, Keith Norris, who puts on the, the Paleo FX conference. Mm -hmm. He's doing. Uh, mm -hmm. He did 40 grams of fish oil a day. Wow. And said his cognitive performance just exploded. Huh. And he felt wonderful. Yeah. And now he's doing like 30,000 of D a day with some K, so there's not a lot of calcification. But nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, so vitamin D and omega threes. Make sure there's a lot of those on the island, so that mm -hmm. I actually can mess around with taking a whole bunch of them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then I would say uh, so supplement or food. Uh, anything. Yeah. Just something that you're really excited about. It can be a supplement or a food or both. Really? It yeah. can be food. Yeah. Hundred percent dark chocolate. Nice. Because it tastes pretty good. Yeah. I actually like the way it tastes. Yeah. It uh, it's honestly got a lot of antioxidants in it. It's technically a fermented food. Mm -hmm. Um makes me happy yeah and it's got some cool cognitive benefits and it goes well with stuff right yeah. so if I can somehow crawl up and get a coconut mm -hmm. I can have like coconut chocolate um, I don't know how well it would go with fish I'd mm. figure that out though but I, I'd just do like a really really good like 100% raw dark chocolate yeah yeah. You know, uh, as an endurance athlete, you'd probably recognize this and appreciate the the uh, vasodilation effect of dark chocolate. Have you? Oh yeah. I used to. I used like, to eat it backstage, and I was yeah. a bodybuilder. I do dark chocolate and red wine backstage. Yeah, yeah to bring out the uh, bring out the veins. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it really works. Yeah. I noticed when I would. Um, so chocolate is a good Valentine's Day food too. That's right. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. Uh, all right. So you're in an elevator with a parliament member, a politician of sorts, and they turned to you and said, "Hey, Ben." You know, what's one lifestyle or health tip you'd want me to know about so I can help my constituency and jurisdiction? Um, you know, thinking big picture level, what would you want them to know? Did you just say a parliament member? Or, you know, someone's... What's, what's a parliament? Someone, a government official from... Are you from Canada? From, I have some, my wife's yeah. Canadian. I okay. spent a lot of Got time it. out there. Got yeah. it. Do they have a parliament in Canada? I they they, they think, call it the... Uh, a parliament. I think I so, know. yeah. All right. Uh, so they asked me, like, what my one lifestyle tip is? Yeah. Is this? Honestly, the number one tip that I would give you would be to never underestimate the power of love, which I know sounds cheesy and obvious, but mm -hmm. everything from studying how to open up the fourth chakra mm -hmm. to using like essential oils that are intended to open up the fourth chakra to listening to music that's tuned to like 528 hertz, which is the frequency associated with the emotion of love 
to uh, adopting a posture that really keeps the chest open and you know turning your torso towards your fellow man or woman when you're talking to them and ensuring that you that you have a deep feeling of love for people who you're interacting with for your own family and for yourself um, love is an incredible incredible emotion it is you know people talk about gratitude which is great for health and conscientiousness which is great for longevity but the greatest emotion of all is love and even you know, I talked about how I'm a Christian, and mm. even in the Bible, it says, you know, the two best things you can do is love your neighbor and love God, right? And that's like the golden rule, just like do unto other people as you would have them do unto you, and that's just love, right? Mm. So I would say that love, and even like taking a deep dive into love and how you can enhance love, the feeling of love, sounds of love, sense of love, love yeah. would, be, would be the number one thing I would recommend. Just, just have as much freaking love in your life as possible. It's an awesome tip. Yeah, and, and that's something that people need to do the inner work. There's no pill or supplement, you know. Well, you mentioned like essential oils potentially, yeah, but there, there is. That's a weird yeah. thing. Is you, you can even, whatever, biohack <laughs> love to a certain extent. Like you can, yeah. you, 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 you can, you, you can at least maximize the effects of, of your other, you know, more natural focusing on love mm -hmm. by using things like, you know, oils and sounds and frequencies and, yeah. and music. And yeah. That's really, so the four chakra, that's a heart chakra. Yeah, four okay. chakra is heart chakra. Yeah. So you know, like essential oils that, that, that um, open up that chakra. Mm -hmm. Like they would be called like root chakra oils. I think root chakra would be, mm. or maybe a fourth chakra. I don't know, I'm not a, an Ayurvedic practitioner. But anyways, I've got, yeah. I've got uh, essential oils downstairs that are specifically designed for like heart and love. Mm -hmm. And there's like, you know, like composers like Michael Tyrell who has CDs called Love Life and Lullabies where they all yeah. vibrate at like 528 hertz. Cool. And uh, That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's a good tip. Uh, so Ben, if, if folks want to connect with you online, I know you have you know, your main website, but you just launched a supplement line to Keon. So where can they do so? Um, you can just Google me, honestly. Yeah. You know, I've got like Instagram and Twitter and podcasts right. and blog and you know, wh wherever you want to, whatever level you want to enter in at. But yeah, um, you got a book called Beyond Training. Mm -hmm. It's about 500 or so pages, just with a lot of like, you know, performance and digestion, fat loss. This is an awesome on, book. Like some, some biohacks. You read it? Yeah. Awesome. Four year, I read it four years ago, yeah. Oh, wow. It came wow. out in 2014, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I just released an updated version in 20, early 2017 mm -hmm. with a bunch, like a lot of extra pages and updated content. And then uh, all my formulations now, because I'm designing a lot of new supplement formulations yeah. for everything from ketosis to testosterone, pre workouts, gut stuff, new fitness gear, new books, everything. Uh, that's over at Keon, um, getkeon.com, K-I-O-N, get K -I -O -N, get uh -huh. keon.com. And, yeah. and that name came about from Chi? Like, yeah, Chi, yeah. life force, prana, chakra, um, energy, breath of life. Uh, the Japanese word for that would be Ki, K-I. Mm -hmm. And uh, oddly enough, like years and years ago, I got it tattooed on my shoulder, like this Chinese Ki oh, wow. symbol. And it turns yeah. out that, that that really wound up being like part of my purpose in life was to bring more more, more of that more. key into people's lives. That's like cool. Energy. You can almost yeah. you can get it down underneath the travel. I can see that. You can barely yeah. see it. That's the Japanese key nice. symbol. Okay. Yeah. But before I even knew how like important that concept of life force and uh -huh. energy was gonna become my own life, I got that tattoo. Wow, so, that's cool. So yeah, yeah. See it's been on your mind for a while. Subconsciously yeah. or subconsciously yeah. and then it manifested. So that's yeah. cool. That's how it works. Yeah. All right, buddy. Great awesome. time with you. Thanks Dude, for coming on. This is a lot of fun. Nice ring. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for the new one. I got Here, we got to pound our cereal box rings. Bam. Boom. All right. All right, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in Thanks and watching guys. all the way to the end. If you like this video, please hit that like button, and I'll put the show notes right below in the description below.